And one more time, thank you very much for the kind um, introduction. I'll talk to you today uh, one more time, and I'll talk to you specifically about the risks and the benefits of liver surgery for uh, metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. So um, one thing that you always have to remember is that about 40 to 60% of patients that present um, to us um, already have a, a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor and that the most common site of metastasis is the liver. We also know that depending on how much tumor you have in your liver, uh, your uh, life expectancy changes. So if you have a lot of tumor in your liver, um, generally uh, your prognosis is worse than if you have less tumor in your liver. Uh, the number one cause of death in neuroendocrine tumor patients is actually um, overwhelming uh, liver tumor burden, meaning that the liver gets uh, replaced by so much tumor that the liver can't function properly anymore. So treatment options for liver metastases, I'm not going to go into these details, but there are the systemic therapies like optreotide, uh, targeted uh, chemotherapy, chemotherapy and PRT. And then there are what we call liver directed therapy, which are uh, the surgical resection or debulking of this liver metastasis, which is what we're going to focus on today, as well as liver directed therapy with radiological procedures. And lastly, uh, potential uh, liver transplant, which is quite rare. There's a, a paper I published here um, uh, a few years ago where we looked at the response rate of these systemic therapies like octreotide, lanreotide, um, everolimus, sunitinib, PRT, and there's very little uh, data on specifically how these medication work on liver metastases. And again, remember liver metastases are what's going to determine your long-term survival. So we need to know more on how these work uh, these uh, systemic therapy work uh, on these liver tumors. But what we do know is that a majority of them does not shrink these tumors, uh, but, be uh, but merely controls uh, the growth of these liver lesions. So why surgery for liver metastasis? Well, first of all, surgery is the only potential for cure, albeit rarely. What I mean by that is that if the tumor has spread to the liver, you have about a 90 to 95% chance after we have operated on it, the tumor will come back at some point. However, uh, there have many studies that shows a survival advantage when you have uh, a liver surgery for liver metastases. The surgical debulking concept um, is uh, also equivalent with resetting the time clock. So remember, these are slow-growing tumors. Um, it usually takes five to 10 years until you have a, a, a significant amount of uh, liver metastases. And if we, if we can take them all out or almost all out, reset you back five or 10 years. Um, and so you gain that, uh, uh, that time towards your lifespan. Um, and then uh, we can um, achieve a shrinkage of the tumor with surgery by removing it, which a lot of systemic therapies cannot do. And lastly, the complications are much decreased with these newer techniques of uh, liver surgery, such as parenchymal spraying resections with or without a microwave ablation. And then lastly, um, uh, there is a question in the room that is an um, interesting question. We're trying to investigate this on whether surgical debulking makes other therapies like PRT, for example, work better. So um, there's been many, many studies with thousands of patients, although they have, are retrospective studies, but many studies with thousands of patients that have shown that hepatic cytoreduction, reduction, so debulking of a liver tumor, um, makes a difference in terms of long-term survival. You can see here, for example, on the right side, if you look at all therapies, those patients that undergo resection of their uh, liver tumors generally tend to do better. Uh, this is Dr. Howe's study from the University of Iowa who compared um, a debulking threshold. So can you take out 70% versus 90% of all the tumor? And we do show, or he did show that, he, uh, that compared to no surgery or less than 70% of debulking uh, definitely you would want to take out as a surgeon at least 70% and ideally 90% because your survival um, uh, probability is going to be vastly improved if you can reach these uh, percentage thresholds. Your overall survival is not dramatically different on whether you remove one to five lesions, six to 10 lesions, or even greater than 10 lesions. As you can see here, that's an interesting concept, right? Other cancers, there have been some studies that have shown that if you have more than three lesions, you're not going to do well either way. So you shouldn't have uh, surgery with neuroendocrine tumors, that is not true. It doesn't matter really how many tumors you have. And this is a study that we uh, looked at, and I wanted to focus on the right side here. 
But essentially what we showed is that if you have a disease in your liver and uh, you get debulking, that's the green curve, you do very well long term. If you have disease in your liver and outside your liver, let's say in your bones, and you undergo debulking, uh, that's the black curve, you still do quite well. Um, but if you, uh, if you don't undergo debulking uh, of the liver, you don't do very well. So that means that you should probably consider, or we should probably consider resecting your liver tumors, even if you have disease outside of the liver, uh, because there's other therapies like PRT and other systemic therapies that can take care of that part. But again, the liver is important because uh, the liver tumor burden is what's going to define how long you're going to live. So is liver surgery safe? It's absolutely safe. The major rate of complication is very low at 30 days. It's uh, less than 10% for most of the surgeries that we do. Uh, these are two studies that looked at, at all kinds of different uh, neuroendocrine tumors. But one thing I will say is that these studies come from experienced centers. So if you do decide to have uh, debulking surgery uh, of your liver tumors, you would want to make sure that you go to someone uh, that know uh, what they're doing. Of course, when not to operate is almost as important as to understand when to operate as surgeons. So here you could see these are uh, uh, livers with a lot of tumors or with a portal vein thrombus, meaning clogging of the vessels that lead into your liver. Those are not good candidates to undergo surgery. When you have greater than 25, some people say greater than 50 percent of, of your tumor uh, of your liver replaced with tumor, you know, surgery is not going to help you because we can't reach the 70 or 90 percent debulking threshold that we need to to do to improve your survival. When you have innumerable tiny metastases, we can't really help you either because they are usually too small for us to even find and uh, and properly remove. If you have carcinoid heart disease, you're not necessarily not a candidate for, for liver debulking, but we got to make sure that your heart gets fixed before we actually do the liver surgery. Obviously, if you're 95 years old and you have poor performance status, surgery is probably not the best option for you. And for high-grade tumor, uh, that's also not a good option because they come back so quickly that surgery um, doesn't make a lot of sense. What we look for on um, MRI and CT before your surgery is where are these lesions distributed. This is a graph of the liver here. You know, the vessels shown in, in uh, red and blue are um, inflow and outflow vessels. And so we got to make sure that the tumors, for example, here in black, you know, um, are away from uh, most of these vessels. Uh, if they are close to some of these vessels, then sometimes we have to take a little bit more uh, liver than just wedging or shelling these tumors out. And this is, for example, a graph that I do before uh, uh, before my surgeries. I hang it in the operating room so I remember where these tumors are and what the relationship are towards the major vessels so that I'm careful uh, not to hurt these structures. And that comes back to the point that we, most of the time nowadays we do parenchymal sparing resections, meaning that we actually remove little of your normal uh, liver. We only or almost exclusively remove or destroy the tumor that is uh, within the liver. And so there are usually absolutely no problems in terms of liver function afterwards we, because we don't take massive amount of healthy uh, uh, liver um, out uh, during surgery. This is an example here. Every, the lesions in red are tumors. And this is how we shell these tumors out. Again, you see what's red is the liver. This little golf ball there that I'm holding up with my forceps is the tumor. And again, little by little, we sort of wedge these lesions out um, and there's different techniques to do that but we have very little blood loss um, and also um, we do not take um, a lot of normal healthy uh, liver tissue because we can shell these tumors out here again you see this is after we have done all of these resections you see the uh, the liver has all these holes in them and again the majority of the liver has is intact the inflow the outflow the bile ducts, all of this is intact. We have not destroyed it. So the liver function is great, even after a major operation like this, with all these holes in your liver, because we have really just removed the tumors and kept the rest of the liver intact. This is a, a, uh, an example of a case where we removed 23 lesion and destroyed 25 lesion with ablation. So that's putting in a catheter um, into some of the tumors and just uh, putting a lot of heat in them to destroy them.
This is the um, MRI after surgery. Here you can see all these lesions are where we are bladed and resected. And in this particular patient is the MRI one year after who showed that we have no tumor left. So the decision process, um, I think is important to think about. And again, I, mean, I don't see uh, surgical debulking as competing with any of the other option. I see it as one of multiple options that, uh, that should be considered uh, for, for the treatment of metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now, one important thing to remember is I, I asked this question uh, before, does surgery help PRT? That's the question, you know, when the NETA1 uh, data came out, it was reanalyzed a little bit later, and it showed that uh, those patients that had uh, small bowel neuroendocrine tumor metastatic to the liver and that had liver tumors or tumors that were greater than three centimeters did less well long-term. Um, and so that's sort of an important piece of information. We don't really know exactly why, uh, but it's possible that PRT works less well with larger tumors. So it could potentially make sense to actually remove larger tumors in the liver surgically or even primary tumors, like shown in this study, um, where they looked at almost 1,000 patients out of Europe, and they showed that if you remove the primary tumors in patients that um, underwent PRT, patients tended to live longer than if you left the primary tumor in. So these are interesting and intriguing questions. And I'll tell you one more time. Look on the right-hand side here, the little red box. But essentially what's important for you to know is that cytoreductive or debulking surgery is um, one of multiple options that can be used for the treatment of metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. You know, it, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a question of competing with like other uh, treatment modalities. I think it's a, it, it's a question of being evaluated at a center that has experience with doing these operations. And in my opinion, if you are a good candidate for all the reasons that I showed you, um, uh, uh, surgical debulking uh, of liver tumors is safe and it can make a huge difference in terms of survival long term. So I think these are very exciting times. There's a couple of clinical trials uh, that we're going to start here. Um, but, uh, but essentially, I see that systemic therapies like PRT and liver-directed therapies, including surgery, work hand in hand. They work together. They are not exclusive of uh, one another. And um, they should be used at the right time uh, so that uh, our patients uh, can live as long as possible. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I hope this was helpful to you, and uh, thank you for joining uh, the virtual meeting.